here you have again Catholics and Ustashi all together. There it talks about disarming the local police. Look out for that. High ranking church officials being loaded up, taken to concentration camps for execution. But you're a, you know, a pastor, you've got a big church building, an independent fundamental church building, the Catholics will take it easy on you, right? I don't think so. The Catholic Church has never believed in persuasion, which is used only when she cannot enjoy absolute power. Very true. Page 83. Priest Ambrosij Novak, you served or condemned to death, and you can only escape that sentence by accepting Catholicism. We read that one too. Father Petar Pajik, until now, God spoke through papal encyclicals, and they closed their ears. Now God has decided to use other methods. He will prepare missions, European missions, world missions. It will be upheld not by priests, uh, but by army com commanders led by Hitler. The sermons will be heard with the help of cannons, machine guns, tanks, and bombers. The language of these sermons will be international. But that died out with Adolf Hitler. That doesn't happen anymore, right? Sure. Page 84. Dr. Ivan Sarek, the Archbishop of Sarajevo and Ustashi since 1934. In the village of Stakade in Lika, Catholic priest Morber, leader of the Ustashi, invited the Serbs to be converted to the Catholic religion. Because those who accepted his proposal to be converted showed some reluctance, the Ustashi surrounded and massacred them with rifles and hammers and threw their bodies into a ditch. When the bodies were dug up later, it was established that many had been alive when buried. Which they did that back during the Reformation years and the, you know, Inquisition years and things like that. They'd regularly bury people alive, sick individuals. Page 86, Priest Ivan Ragos, he repeatedly urged the killing of all Serbs, including children, so that even the seed of these beasts is not left. They consider you to be an animal. Pretty disgusting. Next page, it says, Father Shreko Perik of the Gorica Monastery near Livno, advocated mass murders with the following words, kill all Serbs, first of all kill my sister, who is married to a Serb, and then all Serbs. When you finish this work, come here to the church and I will confess you and free you from sin. This resulted in a massacre on August 10, 1941, during which over 5,600 Orthodox Serbs in the district of Livno alone lost their lives. Again, we read a little bit more of that earlier. But, you know, the thing of him saying, kill my sister because she's married to a Serb, Insane. Page 89. Not one single member of their clergy, while the independent kingdom of Croatia lasted, was ever killed or was ever called to account by them. Not a single priest was by them ever punished, suspended, or unfrocked. They do the same thing today. You know, these priests are getting called all the time, uh, molesting children, and it's just like, well, I'll just ship the guy over here, whatever over there, and stuff like this. Same criminal organization. Page 91. In the village of uh, Susan Jari, for instance, after killing most of the inhabitants, the Ustashi led about 20 surviving children whom they tied to the thresh threshold of a barn, which was then set on fire. Most were burned alive. The few who survived horribly scorched were then killed. As testified by eyewitness, I'll just let you read the name there, the Lujbogov, Bo Milo's case. On September 13, 1941, several youngsters were impaled. Girls had their breasts cut and their hands made to pass through them. Again, you know, I mean, you're, you're dealing with some very sick people here. Picture of Ante Pavlik there with all the Catholic priests. Again, more officers meeting with uh, Catholic priests. Uh, this is page 96. Documents relating to their origin often having been willfully destroyed, fleeing Ustashi took a number of such children with them to their main country of refuge, the Argentine. Others were taken to Italy. Uh, there's different people that hold to a theory that actually Adolf Hitler did not die in Berlin of suicide. There's, you know, there's all kinds of cover-up that went on there. Um, you know, couldn't look at his dental records and couldn't look at this and couldn't look at that. Um... I mean, even the United States Army back at the time, you know, they were like, 
we don't see any proof here at all. The Russians were saying Hitler, you know, fled Germany. He wasn't even there. But the history books, oh, he died in Berlin. Mm -hmm, sure. But there was a huge Nazi movement down in Argentina. And that's where all these Ustashi guy went. You know, Ustashi men went to. Next page, it says, Our universal mission, the salvation of souls, and the greatest glory of our Lord Jesus Christ is involved in this issue. Again, you'll hear that with, with Anderson. You know, I don't hate the Jewish people. We're trying to convert them to Catholics like him. Ante Pavlik again. There he is with a bunch of nuns. Page 100. The revival of a policy of forcible conversion assumes an even more portentous significance when one remembers that it occurred uh, with the tacit approval of the Vatican. Had the Vatican disapproved, not a single priest could have taken part in the massacres or forcible conversions. But why would the Vatican disapprove? They're all for that. If the responsibility for the monstrous, monstrous persecutions rests with the head of the national hierarchy, i.e. Stepanek, it has automatic, automatically to rest also with the head of the universal church, without whose consent the Catholic hierarchy would not have dared to act, i.e. with Pius XII. And that's exactly true. Pope Pius XII was never brought out as a war criminal. He totally got away with it. Uh, Pius XII, it should never be forgotten, had a personal representative in Croatia whose task was to implement Vatican policy and coordinate it with that of Pavlik, as well as reporting on religious and political matters to the Pope himself. Yep. Page 103. Catholic padres in the Ustashi asked for money also as a condition for saving the lives of those they converted. Uh, example given there, the Catholic priest of Ogilin, Canon Ivan Mikin, who charged 180 diners or dinars, excuse me, for each forced conversion. In the Orthodox village of Jesenik alone, he collected 80,000 dinars. Catholic monasteries became gorged with Orthodox valuables and goods. Many of those were sent to the Catholic bishops. So they love money too. Kind of like Stephen Anderson taking a 1683 or 38, I forget what it, which one it was. Uh, I think it was 1638 King James Bible and saying we're going to cut it up and sell each page for $70. Yeah. Page 104. Between April and June 1941, over 1,000 Orthodox Serbs were massacred. Yet Cardinal Tisserin, on July 17, 1941, had the audacity to declare that Archbishop Stepanek would now do a great work for the development of Catholicism in the independent state of Croatia, where there are such great hopes for the conversion of those who are not of the true faith. Just like these anti-Semitic people say. May 8, 1944, His Eminence Archbishop Stepanek, head of the Catholic hierarchy, in fact, informed the Holy Father that to date, 244,000 Orthodox Serbs had been converted to the Church of God. Yeah. Page 105. When finally there, there are these could no longer be denied, counter-rumors began to circulate to the effect that they were anti-Catholic propaganda, anti croat lies, indeed even Gestapo cooked inventions. The Croats and their Catholic supporters accused the Nazis, the Communists, the Serbs, and even the Allies in turn of having started the atrocity stories. <laughs> See, nothing's changed. I mean, this is incredible. It's just the same thing with Anders Stink and these other anti-Semitic replacement theology, Holocaust-denying Catholics of today. They'll deny it. I don't, we didn't do anything. I, don't, I never even heard of any of this stuff. We're, we're, we're innocent. Yeah, sure. Page 106. A minister of the Yugoslav government in charge of finances, a devout Catholic croat, had withdrawn the necessary money. Yes, they did that too. There's a lot of money running and things too that happened in World War II. Next page. We are sorry to have to relate that in all these misdeeds, the Catholic clergy also participated. They admit to it, in other words. The Orthodox preach, priest, uh, the Jorge Bajic of Nessis, killed 18th June 1941. Priest Bajic was tied to a tree and tortured. Uh, they first cut off his ears, nose, and tongue, then pulled off his beard together with the skin. He died only after they ripped open his chest. And that type of stuff happened a lot. You know, 
here you can see this young man here and he's smiling there just looking at you know look at that dead body there just smiling about it during the night of 31st July uh, through 1st of August 1941 in the town of uh, Prigidor the Ustashi massacred 1400 people the Nazis were so horrified that they occupied the town and compelled the Ustashi to leave we read about that earlier In the village of Corito, the archbishop's record records hundred records 163 peasants were tortured, tied into bundles of three, and thrown into a pit. Some were found still alive, so the Ustashi threw in bombs to finish them off. More than 600 people were killed in and around Krupa between July 25th and 30th. Most of them had been cut to pieces with knives, axes, and scythes. In one place, four Orthodox Serbs were crucified on the doors of their houses, tortured, and finally killed with knives reported the Daily Telegraph, 3rd of January, 1942. Page 112. Adamic could not deny the existence of photographs, but no one should believe them, he com commented. Here are his words. Kind of sounds like Stephen Anderson. Oh, what about the eyewitnesses? What about the photographs? Oh, that's all just lies. But let's read here. It says, photographs of the massacres existed. I saw them. Some were horrible beyond utterance. Uh, there were pictures of vast piles of bodies of stacked up heads, tubfuls of necklaces of human eyes, but only a few looked authentic. It was clear that most of them were arranged by Gestapo photographers. In one or, or in two or three pictures, men in the garb of Catholic priests were among Ustashi, after which Adamic drew his own conclusion. All or most of the pictures, he said, were taken by Gestapo agents. We turned them over to Serbian Orthodox clergymen. The Orthodox priests reacted just as the Gustapo had expected. They must get this information to the Yugoslav government in uh, London. The Gestapo helped to arrange this. A Serbian messenger, Dr. Sikolic, got out of Axis-occupied Yugoslavia with a germ, German and a Quisling passport and gave the photographs, the report of a puppet bishop, and other documents all Gestapo approved to the Yugoslav diplomatic office officials in Istanbul. Um, the material was then rushed to London by the same courier. Sekulic, British authorities arrested him as a Nazi agent, but he was released on the insistence of the Yugoslav uh, government's inner clique. The inner clique continued Adamic, replayed the Gestapo information about the massacres by diplomatic pouch to Fodic in Washington and elsewhere. It also submitted the story to the Bishop of Canterbury, who reacted just as the clique and Hitler desired, and so on. The Catholic and Catholic-controlled press and radio of the USA and Allied governments followed suit. Result, the atrocities were minimized, their genuineness questioned when not attributed to anti-Catholic propaganda, and finally they were forgotten. And by the way, the Catholics are the ones that control the media. You know, all this stuff. Well, it's the Jews. The Jews control the media. Nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. And, you know, these people say, well, there are Jews that are in it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, when I say that when I defend Jewish people, I'm not saying that they're all saved, that they're all good people. There are Jews that have gone over and joined with Catholicism. I showed the, the big Jewish rabbi that's now been awarded this, this knighthood or whatever else by the, the Pope. You know, so there are Jews that are very bad, but you don't say, well, because there are Jews that are bad, then we condemn all Jews, the Jewish people. That's what Catholics do. Uh, just looking here, talking about this man lost 25 members of his family, all burned alive. Next page, page 115. Not long after Mr. Winston Churchill took Adamic to court in 1947, the present author at a pri private dinner in Upper Brook Street, Mayfair, London, met Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, wife of the late American, later American president. Since at this period the author was engaged upon his in inquiries concerning the authenticity of the Ustashi, he asked Mrs. Roosevelt whether she had ever heard of them. Now look at this. Could she explain why these Catholic atrocities were not as well known as the Nazi ones? Nazi Germany is no more, replied Mrs. Roosevelt. The Catholic Church is still here with us, more powerful than ever, with her own press and the world press at her bidding, 
Anything published about the atrocities in the future will not be believed. The present author thereupon told her he was writing a book about them. Your book might con convince a few, she commented, but what about the hundreds of millions already brainwashed by Catholic propaganda? It's the president's wife. A few years later, in 1953, within, when the book was eventually published, although two editions were sold within weeks, uh, no part of the British or American press even or dared even to mention it. Talking about this book right here. Mainstream media wouldn't even talk about it. But you got former President Franklin Delano Roosevelt there, Eleanor Roosevelt, his, his wife, she's like, yeah, the Catholics are still in power. That's why it's going to be covered up. Page 116, utter nonsense, rubbish, and things of the past. And even if true, why revive them now? You know, again, see, that's another thing, one of the tactics of the Catholics. They'll, they'll do this thing. All oh, that Holocaust stuff is all crazy. There's no truth to it. And even so, why revive it? Because the same criminal organization is still in power. And because that same criminal organization that's still in power is planning to do more holocausts, more slaughters. Page 118. Their silence cost the lives of 850,000 men, women, and children the bloodiest religious massacre of the century. Okay? The Catholic hierarchy. Of course they're going to be silent. They're the ones that are doing things. They're the ones that are killing. Page 122. The Ustashi ran for their lives. Some were executed. Many escaped. Pavlik fled to Austria, where he, had, he was made a prisoner by the American forces near Salzburg. Uh, while preparations for his official trial were well on their way, a mysterious intervention stopped the proceedings. Why? Pavlik was released unconditionally. Pius XII, through Stepanek and the Archbishop of Salzburg, had seen to it that his protege did not suffer the fate of many other war criminals who were hanged. Pavlik, rendered immune by the powerful papal protection, traveled to Italy and found it in the Vatican City, where he waited for easier times. After a while to avoid scandal, the Pope, now a pillar of the victorious democracies, required Pavlik to quit Rome. Pavlik went from one monastery to another in monkish disguise under various aliases, Father Benares or Father Gomez. So, you know, the Catholics are protecting the Ustashi, as the U.S. State Department did as well, the Nazis and the Ustashi. Page 125, to give one typical example, on one single day in June 1949, Pius XII received five USA generals in successive audiences. Oh, our military is not controlled by the Vatican, though. Sure. Right. All these went to see not the self-styled papal prince of peace. They went to talk with the Pope like them, a man of war. Amen. Yep. You want to talk about the, the most powerful military dictator in the world? The Pope. Down here, further down on the page, August on August 27, 1950, Mr. Francis Matthews, uh, during a speech in Boston, called upon the United States to become the first aggressor for peace, in plain words, to launch a third world conflict, that is, to... Uh, initiate an atomic war, Mr. Francis Matthews was neither a crank nor an irresponsible citizen. He was a powerful man in the American government, none other than the Secretary of the American Navy. But Mr. Matthews was also something that, which at this juncture was perhaps even more ominous. He was a fanatical Catholic, honored many times for his services to Catholic welfare work, and more than that, Mr. Mel Matthews had been the head of the most villainous Catholic organization in the whole of the USA, that is, the Knights of Columbus. And as if that were not sufficient, he was nothing less than a secret papal chamberlain of Pope Pius XII. Oh, the Knights of Columbus, it's just a little do-gooder organization. They just, they're just that little club and stuff like this, and just like the Masons and all this other stuff. Right. It's an army of fanatical Catholics. Page 128. Although only about one-third of the Yugoslav population is Catholic, the government saw to it that all the officials at the trial were Croatian Catholics. They control all kinds of stuff, brethren. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Talking about Stepanek from Archbishop became a cardinal in 1953, so he was promoted. 
this uh, Step, Stepanek or Stepanek or whatever you want to say his name, he was promoted for his work slaughtering, you know, people in Croatia, Orthodox people in Croatia. The appeal of the resuscitated terrorist bands within the headquarters in the USA. Again, talking about that. Terrorism is, is grown in America by the CIA. The CIA was founded by Catholics. It's just incredible. Page 132. Pavlik had in 1948, thanks again to Vatican help, managed to leave Europe, supplied with false documents given in Rome on an international Red Cross passport. He went to another Catholic country harboring Nazi leaders, the Argentine. Argentina, in other words. Next page, page 133. The next year, as we have already seen, the United States Secret Secretary of the Navy, the Secret Chamberlain of the Pope, shocked the world by openly asking the USA to start a pre preventive atomic war against Russia in order to liberate the people of the earth. Again, you're seeing that same kind of stuff today. Lots of talk of war. Page 135. After the main actors of the Nazi regime, following the Nuremberg trial, were executed by the victorious allies, thousands of minor war criminals took cover under the protective wings of the Catholic Church. Yep. Absolutely. Page 138. Indeed, the Mafia, on more than one occasion, acted as a fairy godmother for the Vatican. The most striking case was when it helped the Vatican transfer tons of pure silver from Naples to Rome to avoid the Germans melting it down to pay for expenses of, expenses of the German occupation. The recruitment of the Mafia would have been reprehensible on the part of both the USA and the Vatican had it not been for the fact that both wished to f help fight the war Help the fight of war criminals, flight of war criminals from Europe, each with its own objectives. Yep, just like I said earlier. Page 142. Thousands of fleeing war criminals were diverted hastily to South American countries with the connivance of the secret services of the USA. Many were helped to enter the USA itself and to settle there under different names and phony identities. I I think I told this story before, but I'll just repeat it again for sake of interest. Uh, I was on a mission trip the one time down in Costa Rica, and we were out in the jungle helping build a little Christian camp thing out there. And the missionary that was there was going to take us and, and introduce us to a, a tribe, an Indian tribe that was like way out in the jungle. And we're like walking along back these little dirt roads and stuff and these rope swingy bridges, you know, over the top of the river. It was kind of interesting. And, um, you know, going back through the jungle and we're just like walking along and all of a sudden it's like there's this sign in Costa Rica, this big, huge sign going back this lane and it's all in German. And we're like, OK, you know, <laughs> I mean, we're here in the jungles of Costa Rica and there's this elaborate big sign. It was a really nice lane going back. There was dirt roads in the area, but it was a nice lane going back. And we're like, I wonder what's back there. And, and we were kind of like, I guess these are some Nazis that fled the war, you know. And I didn't even know that that actually happened. So, you know, I personally can attest to the fact that Central and South America, you know, there's some weird stuff going on down in there. Page 144. Declassification revealed what has had been suspected all the time, namely that the USA and the Vatican had helped and indeed had shipped thousands of war criminals to Australia, Latin America, and indeed to the USA and Canada, even before the war had ended. The folk singer, country slash folk singer, he's a new ager, uh, John Denver, a perfect example. His dad was a Nazi scientist, shipped here after the war. John Denver's real name is Henry John Deutschendorf, okay? He's the son of a German Nazi, brought here. Page 146. One of, the, one of these was Franz von Papen, an official war criminal. Pius XII pleaded for him behind the scene, and von Papen not only avoided death, but after a few years was released. Von Papen was the leader of the Catholic Party of Germany. There's his picture. Innocent observers, observers had noticed that several so-called nuns were of rough appearance, masculine demeanor, and appeared to be unshaven. 
In other words, they smuggled some of these Ustashi and Nazis and things out as nuns. Nice. There's the author meeting with uh, a man there. General Murkovich with the author. There he is again meeting with another man. Hitler right there meeting with a Catholic. Again, the author meeting with more men. I mean, he's, you know, Avram Manhattan met with these people and talked to them. Eyewitnesses, you know, which Catholics like Stephen Anderson say, the, eye with, the eyewitnesses are lying. They're just lying, you know. Okay, in the town of Grakik, the Ustashi butcher their Orthodox victim, victims in the local butcher's shop. This was discovered by the local authorities owing to the rivulets of human blood flowing into the gutter. Nice. Uh, page 155. A young man about 17 had escaped being burnt alive simply because upon seeing a group of Ustashi coming surreptitiously into his village, he had hid him, hidden himself in a nearby ditch. He witnessed a horrific deed. The Ustashi rounded up all his family, shut all the pimp members in a barn full of hay, and then set it alight. Everybody in it was burnt alive. Many bookshops, including Protestant ones, refused to sell the book. Fear of offending the Catholic interest had already become that great. Okay, talking about this one. And of course, you know, you go to the average quote-unquote Christian bookstore, you know, and they won't, they wouldn't put this book in their shop if their lives depended on it. Go to christianbook.com. They got, you type, just go to, uh, yeah, I think it's christianbook.com. Type in Catholic. Thousands of results will come up. Pro-Catholic books. This? Are you kidding me? Books defending the King James Bible, like a lot of these up here. Are you crazy? They won't sell that. Uh, I thought this was funny. This uh, woman over here. Let me show you this picture here quick. This woman, uh, Catholic Terror uh, Today. She took the book and she, she basically gave it to the Archbishop of uh, Paul's, St. Paul's Cathedral and he chucked it across the room and the book hit a couple of Catholic nuns who made several signs of the cross. <laughs> I love that. You know, he takes this book, looks at it, and throws it and it goes over and whacks a couple of Catholic nuns and they're over there going like this, you know, this horrible, cursed, you know, book of truth, you know, just hit them. Here again, uh, Avro Manhattan talking to survivors. On 13th of June, 1942, the Ustashi executed the father of Sava um, Raidur Baba in his native village of Bral Bralovsi, after which they amused themselves by torching Sava's 13-year-old sister. This they did by choking her at ever longer interval intervals until she was finally strangled. Not content with it, they crushed all her bones to such an extent that most of the girl's members were reduced to almost pulp. Then they cut. They then cut the tongue of another young woman of the same village, cutting holes in both her cheeks. She was eventually stabbed to death. So you say, well, I don't think it'd be a big deal if the Catholics totally took over here in America. That's what would happen. That's why we have to fight, as Bible-believing Christians, we have to fight this Catholic influence. Page 163, the ambassador told the author that such literature was no longer useful. The Croatian massacres, he said, should be forgotten. Exactly what the Pope said when he addressed the stupid little audience there of, of uh, charismaniacs with uh, Kenneth Copeland. What, whatever happened in the past, well, it's just kind of in the past. Let's forget that. Let's forget it. The Lord isn't forgetting it. And they will answer. Here again, you have this guy, Cardinal uh, Sepper. The appointment, it must be remembered, took place in 1968, several years after the Second Vatican Council, which had promoted ecumenism and unity, and during the pontificate of Pope Paul VI. Why had uh, Major F. Uh, Sepper 
probably not getting that. Maybe it's Monsignor, I'm not sure. But uh, F. Sepper's appointment had such great significance for Catholics and Protestants alike because Cardinal F. Sepper was none other than the Archbishop of Zagreb, the capital of the former Eustachi Croatia. He was the man who had succeeded the Archbishop, later Cardinal Stepanek, the friend and associate of Ante Pavlik. Yes, the successor of that same Stepanek, who from the same Episcopal see had inspired mass forcible conversions, mass deportations of Orthodox priests and laymen, and who had big, blessed the Ustashi murderers of more than half a million people. That's the sick individual there. But he's going to come together, Second Vatican Council, and and let's talk about unity. Uh huh. Yeah, you know, let's unify, let's bring everybody together so we can slaughter them much easier that way. Page 170. The warning had been motivated by the fact that a few months before, a writer who had delivered a speech from that same rostrum had been shot to death while speaking. A niece of his in the audience, who had gone up to the platform to help him, also had been shot. Don't accept impromptu invitations unless checked by the committee, he was warned. Two days later, there took a play, uh, place a large meeting just on the outskirts of Chicago. The meeting was postponed for almost an hour because of the absence of the main organizer. The, the, later, the latter finally arrived in a taxi. He explained the cause of his delay. A bomb had been found under his Cadillac and had to be defused by the police. Okay. This is years after the war had ended here in America. And the Ustashi were carrying things out. Page 172. After the crowd had dispersed and many had bought a copy of the book signed by the author, the present writer was having a drink standing at the bar uh, when he noticed a man wearing a hat whose brim hid his eyes. He had been observing, pretending to drink. After a while, when the present author was alone, he approached him with an almost feline smoothness. After a few seconds, he whispered a few words as he looked at the other side of the bar. I came to the convention to kill you. Lucky that you said what you did. The individual had whispered these words with such a matter-of-fact and unemotional tone of his voice, a voice that it had sounded unreal. He kept a hand, the right hand, under his jacket and had looked significantly at the, at the bulk under it. Then as people were coming toward us, he asked the present author for a copy of the book, complete with autograph, which he bought. Thereupon, having given a courteous greeting, he departed. The bodyguard who had absented himself when told of the in, in Incident froze. He is one of the most ruthless Eustachi killers, he commented. I kept him under surveillance all the time. The present author returned to Los Angeles, having experienced a matter-of-fact encounter, a personal Eustachi reality. Okay. Avra Manhattan was at this conference presenting his book, and there was a man there, a Eustachi murderer, that actually was going to kill him. And the opportunity did not present itself. And this bodyguard guy had been assigned to Avery Manhattan to keep him safe, and he wasn't there at the time. Page 173. When asked to express their abhorrence for the deeds committed by the Ustashis of Catholic Croatia, they both kept their silence. Silence means approval. Talking about the Vatican, by the way, there. And if you stay silent about the atrocities of Catholicism, then you are, in effect, approving of them. If you say, well, I don't want to judge Catholics and I don't want to judge what, what happened in the past, then you're approving of what they did. Page 174. The thousands of Eustachi who fled to various countries, helped by the Vatican itself, once settled in their host lands, were protected, ipso facto, by the local Catholic clergy. And they have done that and they will continue to do that. Page 176. Artikovic uh, lived peacefully, peacefully for over 40 years in the U.S. and was finally extradited from there in February 1986 after a legal battle which lasted well over 30 long years, a somber spectacle of the tremendous power of the Catholic Church in America. There you have a picture of this man. You can read that, pause it and read it. 1986, finally got the trial that he deserved. Page 185, 
1946, Our Lady was solemnly crowned before half a million pilgrims. The crown, weighing 1,200 grams of gold, had 313 pearls, 1,250 precious stones, and 1,400 diamonds. Revelation chapter 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And you get a bunch of liars out there saying, Mystery Babylon there, Revelation 17, that's describing America. Catholic lies is all it is. It's disgusting. Page 186, on August 6, 1949, Catholic McGrath, Attorney General, addressing the Catholic stormtroopers of the USA, namely the Knights of Columbus, at their convention in Portland, Oregon, urged Catholics to rise up and put on the armor of the church militant in the battle to save Christianity. Christianity, of course, meaning for a Catholic, the Catholic Church. He further urged a bold offensive. 1949, after World War II. Page 189. More sinister still, the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus, the shock troops of Catholic power in the USA. The hidden army. But that's okay. We shouldn't judge Catholics and we should just kind of, you know, we shouldn't judge Vatican versions or other things that come out of Catholicism. We shouldn't judge Catholics that are closet Catholics. Let's not be rough on this stuff, you know. See, that whole thing, that whole philosophy of let's just take it easy, let's not talk about what happened in the past, let's not bring up Catholic atrocities and stuff, that's exactly what they want you to do. They're disarming you mentally first, and then they will disarm you uh, physically. You take your weapons from you later, and then the slaughter begins. Page 196, John Foster Dulles, the U.S. Secretary of State, he knew simply because he was one of the main organizers of the Grand Vatican CIA Fatima scheme, or Fatima, however you want to say it. Page 200, the following year, October 1958, Pius XII, assailed by ever more frequent attacks of nerves, asthma, and a general neurosis, and a victim of the immense amount of drugs that had sustained him for years, Possibly the real cause of many hallucinations, promptly accounted as miracles by his admirers, died and went to hell and is burning. And we will see him at the Great White Throne Judgment when he comes up and has his final judgment and is cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Page 205. That was not all. The Catholic Church mobilized her most feared spiritual weapons and unblushingly used religious terror to compel voters to vote her way. Imitating Pope Pius XII, who years before had done the same, they told the Maltese in no uncertain terms that unless they voted for the political party favored by the church, they would be grilled in the flames of hell for endless millions of years. Purgatory, in this case, was to be bypassed altogether. Priests all over the island told, vote, told voters that it was a mortal sin to vote for labor. The archbishop himself gave specific instructions to that effect. Preachers can indeed be of great service for the... Reassertion of the church, both in civil and political matters, on the, as the occasion demands, and for the rep recuperation of souls lost on account of political matters in their sermons or speeches, they should explain the divine influence of the church for the formation of a perfect society, both private and public, about the divine power of the church and her unerring judgment, even in civil laws, about the gravity of mortal sin, the utility of Catholic associations. Uh, the archbishops... Uh, words were confirmed by the Bishop of Gozu, uh, who in April of the same year published a circular telling Catholic voters that to belong to the Labor Party or even to attend its meetings was a mortal sin. So again, the Catholic Church will work in the political realm just like they'll work in the church realm. Page 206. That is, uh, she transformed the sacrosanct confessional into a polling ballot box. Confessors were ordered to tell Penitence, penitence, how to vote. Disobedience meant refusal of absolution. In other words, the Catholic priests would not absolve people of their sins unless they voted for the particular uh, elected officials there. 
Finally, on the eve of the elections, crucifixes draped in mourning were paraded in village squares with a caption, Why are you voting against me? <laughs> you know, yeah, sure. And it gets into a bunch of other things there, but that's it for what I have highlighted. Um, I mean, if you want to read a good book, that's the book for you right there. Uh, just incredible. I mean, you know, the Catholics will duck all this stuff. They'll try to say, well, you know, there might have been some Protestants killed back in the, you know, 1500s, you know, and right around there. But, uh, you know, that was in the past. You know, just let, let's just let the past, forget about the past. You know, just forget about it, you know. Well, here's a book that talks about less than 100 years ago how the Roman Catholics were slaughtering people, uh, millions and millions of people, if you want to talk about Nazi Germany and over there in the Catholic Croatia with the Ustashi. Um, these uh, murderers are still out there. Uh, they're younger now. They are not the same ones that did the killings back then, but uh, there are those out there that would kill just as violently and just as cruel uh, means by just as cruel means as what happened back here. And that's important. That's why it's so important for us to to not forget what happened and to to bring out this information, to, to not let anybody talk us out of this whole thing of, of the Holocaust, the horrors of the Holocaust and everything else. Uh, Hitler hated the Jews and he was out to exterminate all of them, not just in Germany. Um, had somebody write in one of the comments about that, you know, if it was just about German, whatever, you know, just getting him out of Germany. Why did he build concentration camps in Poland? You know, Hitler wanted to wipe out all Jews. I mean, you see that if you read Mein Kampf. I've talked about that in other studies. I mean, this stuff's proven. The Catholics are so busy trying to rewrite history and cover up for their bloody, horrible crimes. And uh, it's, that's why it's so disgusting. And that's why I fight so hard against Roman Catholicism. Because it is Satan's system. It really is. It's the most satanic system out there. So that's my book review of the Vatican's Holocaust. Um, very, very good book. Definitely one uh, that presents the truth of history, the truth that has been covered up by the Catholic-controlled media. So that's going to be it for this book review here. Um, but I, just, I can't stress it enough that we just need to be ever vigilant about the Catholic system. We, we cannot forget what they did in the past. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.